Hello, everyone. My name is Lucy Schiffman, and I'm the Senior Manager of Community Engagement with the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. I am so excited to be welcoming you to our first program of the first annual Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion Awareness Month, which will be happening annually in July from here on out. Um, before we begin, I want to share a little bit more about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We envision a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy. Our mission is made up of three sections, community, care, and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care, and we accelerate research towards treatments and a cure. At MDF, we have a wide range of resources and support for our DM community. First, we have toolkits and publications. Um, these are resources for care providers and families that include anesthesia guidelines, the MDF toolkit, clinical care recommendations, and of course, the exercise guide for people living with myotonic dy dystrophy. We also have additional resources for clinicians and researchers, researchers, including grant funding opportunities for DM research. We have support groups, which are led by our trained community volunteers, our support group facilitators. Our support programs create safe spaces to network, learn, and share. On our website, you can also see our calendar of events, which you will find all of our upcoming support programs, conferences, webinars, and more, including our annual conference, which will be he held um, on May 2nd through the 4th, 2025 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Lastly, on our website, you can find the Digital Academy, where you have the opportunity to view hours of educational and inspirational videos by DM experts on demand. You can find all of these resources and more at www.myotonic.org. You can also learn more about our upcoming Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion Awareness Month programming. As I mentioned, this is just the first of four different programs. Um, so next week is week two, Little Things Count, where we'll be having a webinar on exercises for everyday life, which will be on Thursday, July 18th at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Week three um, is The Natural World, where we'll be having a webinar on the benefits of nature and breath work on Wednesday, July 24th at 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. And finally, on week four, we're going to have motivation. Let's keep it going. We'll be celebrating all of the work we've accomplished this month through a virtual Zumba class on Wednesday, July 31st at 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. We also have a bonus webinar this month, which is really exciting, and part of our Ask the Expert series on DM and the Heart, which will take place on Thursday, July 25th at 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. Another exciting part of Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion Month is that we have amazing Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion merchandise. So we don't want you to miss out on the chance to order a limited edition Movement Makes Connection t-shirts, which is available in a variety of styles and colors, as well as our exercise gear, which includes jackets, tank tops, bike shorts, and more. You can find all of this um, at our website, myotonic.org slash in dash motion. We are so excited to have all of you join us today from around the world. Today's program will be a Stump the Doctor and community member panel where you will have the opportunity to ask your movement related questions. We ask that you use the Q&A function through Zoom to ask your questions, which you can find either on the bottom of your Zoom screen um, or by clicking the three ellipses under more and finding Q&A to type and submit your questions. The questions will be sent to our panelists and I as a moderator will be reading them out loud for our panelists to answer. As a reminder, our panelists cannot give medical advice, so please try to ask questions that are general to the DM community rather than very specific to your experience. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can over the next 45 minutes. I just want to take one moment to thank our movement committee, which is a group of community members and experts who are dedicated to movement um, and in our community for putting this event on, as well as our event sponsor, Avidity Biosciences. It's now my pleasure to introduce our amazing panel for the evening. Um, we have four panelists, starting with Dr. Donovan Lott, 
um, who received his master's in physical therapy and then his PhD in movement science from Washington University. He is now a research associate professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, in Gainesville with the Department of Physical Therapy. His research interests include investigating skeletal muscle damage, exercise and the relationship between muscle pathology and functional mobility in people with neuromuscular disease. Next, we have Ryan Vogels, who is one of our MDF support group facilitators and a community member living with myotonic dystrophy type 2. Ryan enjoys boating, camping, rock hounding, and other activities he can do outside with his family. Ryan was a vol volunteer firefighter for 10 years and likes to push back on DM as much as it pushes him. Next, we have Luke Bolt, who is one of the founders of the Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion program. He's currently a grad student studying nutrition and exercise physiology and enjoys running, biking, lifting weights, and occasionally standing stand-up paddleboarding or swimming. Rounding out our panel, we have Margie. Uh, Margie Singleton is a DM community member living with myotonic dystrophy type 1. Margie loves walking, spending time in nature, and is incredibly grateful for her new walker that has wider wheels, which make it easier to navigate cracked and bumpy sidewalks in her neighborhood. She also enjoys chair yoga and water fitness. So... We are going to start our, our panel off with a question for our community members. And like I said, anytime you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A um, in the Q&A function and, and we will we will ask it out loud. Um, so our first question, I'm going to hand it over to our community members. Um, take a minute to tell us more about yourself. What motivates you to exercise or keep up a movement practice? I'll pass it to Ryan first. Sorry about that, struggling with the mute function. Got it, no. Um, anyway, uh, I was fortunate enough prior to diagnosis to um, have a strong workout history. And I think that helped me um, stay active now. I remember after diagnosis that um, I was talking to somebody else and my wife overheard me say that I was going to beat my autonomic dystrophy. Uh, she's an RN of many years and she assured me that you cannot beat my autonomic dystrophy. And while I knew that, um, in my head, beating my atomic dystrophy is something a little bit different. It's setting goals and things that you want to accomplish. Uh, for example, one thing I said to my wife was, I want to be able to walk both my daughters down the aisle. And that struck me with me ever since then. Um, and that pushed me to continue working out. And I found that just structuring my day the same every day to make sure I can fit in my workout has helped me maintain my workout history. Thank you, Ryan. Margie, up to you next. Oop. Margie, you also have to unmute. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I forget sometimes. Um, hi, I'm Margie Singleton. Grateful to be with you all today. Um, I really, I have found for me, well, when I, well just real quick, when I was first, uh, first diagnosed with DM1 back in 2010, um, I was told that I really shouldn't exercise because it could damage my muscles further than they've already been damaged. Um, they we weaken them and, and it was just better just to not exercise, which was kind of, I wasn't, which was like, okay, that's weird. And I don't, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, I'm not, a, when I was in high school, I was a big athlete. I did, I did field hockey, I did soccer, I did basketball i played tennis and swim team and stuff in the summertime and so i was very active and i really enjoyed that and i also got into you know, hiking and and rock climbing and i loved all of that stuff and it's just been you know since since that time 2010 i really i i i had well my my whole work uh, workout stuff had just fallen to pieces before all that happened and i was never really like as a, as a grown-up i haven't been very active in you know as a grown-up 56 <laughs> um uh you know i haven't been very active until like last year and i heard some new research at the time or maybe two years ago it like it pandemic it was sometime during the pandemic i don't know when but it happened during that time and i had been to a um, one of our our um support groups here in kansas city and our, we, there was new research out that doing exercise is actually a very good thing which i kind of believed anyway but i had been doing chair yoga um, in and out because I I had been doing I I was a big yoga person back when I was much more able to do things um, you know progressive progressive thing that's it's it's just every 
day, it seems, at least when I was, when I was really a few years back, when I was when all my symptoms were really coming into play, um, it was it was like every day is something new I couldn't do. I couldn't stand my toes. I couldn't run. I couldn't X, Y, and Z. And the list kept getting. And I started to think about what what I can do because I had to be positive and stay like, well, well, I can do chair yoga, for example. I love chair yoga. I can do like you know moderate exercise in the pool. I love doing that. I also, I have a new app on my phone that I use, which is great. Like, I just, just exercise just makes you feel better emotionally, physically. And when I, when my body is working right, I just feel good. I feel like I can do anything. I mean, I, I, I like, for example, right now, I'm, I've just moved into my father, long story, but anyway, I'm, I'm here and I'm making dinner, which I haven't done in so long because, well, because he doesn't know how to cook one and two. You know, I I eat very, very healthy and making baked tofu and red rice, really exciting stuff. But, you know, he's he's like, oh, tofu, huh? <laughs> but yeah. that's what I do. That's I have to eat well. I have to exercise, do all the things that people tell you to do and, it, anyway. And, and just to kind of keep on keep on doing it. And, you know, I, I, I think about this. I'm going to quote on this. Anyway, but I love, I'm just I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here and, and talk about how exercises helped me a lot right through this process. So thank you. Thank you, Margie. And let's hear from Luke. And then I'm seeing your questions start to rattle in. So we'll, we'll ask some of those next. Yeah. So um, like Nikki said, I'm Luke. Um, I was diagnosed uh, when I was about 13, uh, first one of my family. And uh, my exercise history is kind of like, this kind of just always been a part of my family. Like everybody in my family was active in some form um, before I was diagnosed. So even after diagnosis, it was like, well, this is just what I've done all my life. So I'll keep doing it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, so now I'm just keeping it up um, with my knowing what my diagnosis is and what some of my limitations are. I try to see if I can prevent um, progression, um, but also um, I just feel a whole lot better just physically and mentally. Like Marty said, just the day the day just feels a lot better if I exercise overall. Um, so yeah, definitely. It's always been a part of my life, and I hope it will stay that way. Awesome. Thank you, all our community panelists. That's great. I'm going to take a question from the community and ask it to Dr. Lott. Um, after being diagnosed with DM, I was told not to exercise, quote, too much. How do I know what is too much when I often don't feel the effects of a great deal of exercise until the next day? And that's a great question because it really comes down to how much is going to be enough to actually cause some beneficial change without causing injury? And there's been a lot of good research out in my entire history that has shown that a moderate amount, whether that's aerobic or cardiovascular kind of exercise or resistance exercise, can be very beneficial. And what is that moderate amount? What what we've seen is shooting where you're, if you're doing resistance kind of activity, where you're doing the uh, if you're doing weightlifting between eight to twelve repetitions. So if you're getting tired between that eight to twelve repetitions with that weight, that would be a good moderate. There's other research that has shown that actually six to eight repetitions, which is a little bit more intense, has had some beneficial effects and nothing that's been severe as far as any kind of detriment. So given that kind of that six to twelve repetitions, if you're doing um, resistance exercise. If you're doing aerobic exercise, the easy thing to do is what's called a talk test. So as you're doing your cardiovascular aerobic kind of exercise, you should be able to go ahead and carry on a conversation. So you can say three to five words, but you should be breathing hard enough that you wouldn't be able to sing. That would be more of a moderate intensity kind of activity that you're doing. Another way to gauge it is using what they call a rating of perceived exertion, where if you have 10 is a completely exhausted, I can't do more, and zero is I'm doing nothing, Right around that six area, six out of 10, that's another way of saying that's a moderate amount of intensity for that. So that's what you look at for both of a resistance kind of activity as well as aerobic kind of activity. 
Awesome. I am seeing a question here. And I think, um, Luke, with your experience in grad school and your experience coming from a family that exercises a lot, you can take a crack at it. If not, um, Dr. Locke can try. But coming from someone who says they're relatively healthy and in addition to some prescriptions, um, takes supplements to help with maintaining muscle and building when possible. Are there any supplements in your experience that have been helpful? I've heard conflicting evidence, for instance, about DM1 and creatine. Um. Creatine is, uh, personally, I do use it and it's, um, I think, I think it is helpful. Um, it could just be a mental thing. Like I take it and I think it's supposed to help. So it, so that it does, but I think there is some research that says creatine is beneficial, um, for my type dystrophy for whatever you're doing. I know it's mainly used for resistance exercise. Um, this is like a pre-workout kind of thing. So I use it, I do use it, and I think it's beneficial, um, personally, but that's, again, it's going to be kind of individual for each person. Um, so yeah, again, I think I find it beneficial, but, and there is some research that shows it might be beneficial. Um, but I'd say it's it, you can try it and if it works for you, that sounds, that's fine, but if not, but it might not. So it's kind of. Hopefully that's a somewhat satisfying answer. It's excellent. Um, Dr. Law, do you have anything to add to that answer? Not a whole lot. I think Luke did a very good job because we don't have a tremendous amount of research to say how effective is creatine and myotonic dystrophy. So it is something that um, as far as being able to try and see how your body responds can be something favorable. Um, it's not something that I see the majority of individuals who are active with myotonic dystrophy diving into deeply. Um and I see Ryan's got his hand up, so I will stop there so we have time to let Ryan answer that as well. And I can come back if needed. I just figured I'd answer with what supplements I use. Um, I know most of us do feel tired uh, every day. And so I do take a pre-workout, uh, an amino acid-based pre-workout. I do take creatine like Luke does. I myself do feel like I get some benefit from it. And then I just use protein um, after the workout as well. And I feel like it's been helping me maintain body mass. Awesome. Um, another question. My insurance is terrible, but lots of people talk about the importance of using a physical therapist to create a safe exercise program. MDF programs talk about this a lot. What should we do if my doctor isn't helpful and my insurance doesn't cover physical therapy? Dr. Lott, I'll send this to you first, and then I will ask our community members to share any resources they use to exercise safely at home. Sure. So I'll try to be a minute or less. I will say first and foremost, one item that I would not say to skip is making sure that you've uh, spoken with your physician before starting a new exercise program. I'm biased. I'm a physical therapist. I think physical therapists have a lot that can be a benefit, but then the physician is a, a mandatory piece. So don't start a new exercise program without consulting with your physician. From a physical therapy perspective, that can be very helpful. However, I think there are other alternative means of doing so. Um, one of them is there are, as was pointed out earlier, there are uh, there's something the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation has that points out here's a document that outlines some specifics for people with myotonic dystrophy, specific for exercise, that have been written by experts um, in exercise and physical therapy. So that I think is a great resource to look at. I think others are there's a lot of other informational sessions here. There's a Zumba um, activity that's going to be towards the end of the month. Um, that's going to be through what we're doing here for the myotonic dystrophy in motion. There are other different meetings where people will go to, and there's different kinds of exercise sessions. I think having a community involvement and being able to dialogue with others with myotonic dystrophy, keep in mind that other kinds of muscular dystrophy are not all the same, but talking to other people can be a very beneficial range as well. But knowing specific guidelines after getting approval from a physician and having a basic knowledge of exercise can be a good means to get started. And I'll let Ryan and Luke and anyone else chime in there as well. I, I did practice with a physical therapist actually prior to diagnosis. Um, so I've just been using that along with uh, guidance from my physician on what is okay for me to be doing. Yeah, it was about the same for me. Um, it was actually after diagnosis that I uh, started working with the PT a little bit. Um, and it was, it was, I found it really helpful and just for some back strength and general, 
kind of strength today. Um, but yeah, I found it really helpful and um, they gave me some things to work on, some of which I still do uh, today, even though I finished that round of PT several years ago now. So it's definitely, definitely helped. And I'll just chime in on one other item. Uh, you know, tr uh, traditionally, people will see physical therapists where they see them for one to three times a week for several weeks. For something like this, get an exercise program start up. If you feel that, you know, I, I, I don't have as much experience as Ryan and Luke with exercise, it may be something where it's going and having one visit with a physical therapist say, and be very clear. My intent is to be able to get set up with an exercise program so that I can be independent. So that's another way of where it still involves physical therapy, but on a much more minimal basis, which from a financial and time consideration may be helpful. Keeping in mind, not all physical therapists know as much about myotonic dystrophy as uh, as as others. And so again, great resource, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. I, I, what physical therapist in my area, who may I be able to reach out to? And there's different means that that can be communicated as well. Excellent. I put in the chat um, the exercise guide for people living with myotonic dystrophy, which is one of those resources resources that we have that you can look through. Um, I have a question here for Margie. Um, what made you decide um, to take the plunge and start using a mobility device to support your exercise habits? <laughs> well, you know, that's funny because I was so resistant to it. I mean, I was very resistant to the whole, I like, I've used over the years Right now, I use a walker and I have a wheelchair for emergencies. But like, I broke my foot in the in the winter time in January, and so I need to a wheelchair for a few weeks to get around. Um, I have a scooter. I but all but all of this started with like being very resistant to using a cane. I was like, I don't want to look like an old lady. I don't want to look like an invalid or like you know. A, <laughs> no, I I, I, was, I had a lot of resistance to it because I just I didn't want to I I wanted to be able to do this on my own just by like my own strength and I realized but I I I did a lot of work with physical physical therapists over the year I, I, over the last 10 years I've been in and out for on and off for different periods of time during the year um I'm, um and um and so I've, I've incorporated a lot of the stuff I've learned in physical therapy into my daily life but the um, yes. Yeah, so, so the 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 when my when my physical therapy started saying, well, I, I don't know if a cane is the best thing for you. You might want to use a walker. I'm like, no, uh, it's not happening. Um, it's not happening. I'm not going to do that. And it was really, I was, I didn't again. I didn't want to look like an old lady. I am getting older. And can't see my silver <laughs> in my hair. And but I didn't want. You know, I've been. I just was. I was resistant i mean i have a father who probably needs a walker he's 86 and he won't use one because i don't know why but anyway and he, he scares me but my balance my balance is very uh not good my um muscles are very weak uh and i you know i try i don't know i mean I, i'm i'm trying to work on it i've been trying to work on it for the last i guess said 10 years um in physical therapy and and doing stuff on my own here at home um so it's it's been it's it's a challenge for sure. And um but 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 that being said, today I'm really grateful I have these 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 different devices I can use for different seasons in my life when I'm you know, like if I go to if I go to Costco, for example, I need I'll I'll use a scooter to get around because it's easier for me to do that because I wear out with my walker um and I there's nowhere to sit. <laughs> So I have a little walker with a seat and it's, it's great. And, um, and that's been a real helpful thing for me. Um, going to like outdoor concerts, <laughs> sitting in my chair is great. It's great. I can sit in my little seat and it's wonderful, but insurance. So I, oh, someone mentioned insurance. I don't know. I have, I have, um, I'm on, I'm on, um, SSDI. So I have disability benefits, which, which allow me to use, um, uh, Medicare, and so I have great, insurance. I mean, they, they are very supportive in me going and getting taken care of. Basically anything I need to be taken care of, um, they do not support my um, prescriptions. I don't have very many prescriptions, and I, not them at this time really deal with, with uh, my isotonic dystrophy, but um, uh, that's something I have to look at. I have to, um, um, but but I've, I've been really fortunate that that uh, the Medicare has really covered my physical therapy with needs, which I I'm I'm 
I, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I, I know that. And uh, I'm grateful that I have it. If you are not sure if you need um, disability assistance, I did. I'm poor. And I needed some help with my medical care. And MD, uh, my type district, is just qualified for disability if you're looking because you're like, I can't find any work because of my lack of concentration and my my inability to focus on things. Um, you know, ADD is a part of of muscular dystrophy, I've heard, and that's a big part of my life. Um, uh, so, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm answering any questions or helping anybody yes. here. But, <laughs> you but, answered the question perfectly, Margie, and, and, and thank you for sharing the resource that we have. Mindy actually put in the chat for everyone to see that there is a resource if you are struggling um, to have your insurance support physical therapy or assistant devices. Um, we have um, a, a partner in the Patient Advocacy um, Foundation. You can go to patientadvocate.org um, and, and find someone to support you um, and talk through your specific case with that. Um, I'm going to move on to another question here, which is about VO2 max. Would it be relevant or beneficial to find out what our VO2 max is? Where would we go to get a proper measurement? Um, and so that question is for uh, Dr. Lott or Ryan or Luke. You seem like people who might know that about yourselves and use that in your exercise um, world. So if you have um, experience with VO2 max, please share. Ryan or Luke, do you want to go ahead first or would you prefer I start? Go for it, Dr. Lott. All right. So, so VO2 max really is, is a measure of looking at what is your cardiovascular function. And to get a VO2 max test, it's something that is done. Generally, it's done in a exercise physiology lab where people are doing things, or it's done in a cardiology kind of laboratory where they're trying to see how much can the heart be taxed. And a traditional thought has been, we don't want to push people with, and I'm just going to say muscular dystrophy in general, to that point of really pushing them that far. However, more recently, we've been able to see that that is something that we can do. And so there's a couple of things as far as if you're going to get it, where could you get it done? Um, and one is talking to your doctor to see if your doctor thinks it's something that's important to be done. And if so, they would likely refer you to a cardiology clinic that can do that kind of testing. I myself have had cardiac conditions of various kinds, so I've had to do these kinds of tests. And I teach the physical therapy students how to do these tests if they end up in a cardiology and excess physiology lab. Um, the other is actually there is a study ongoing at Stanford University right now where Tina Duong, who is a member of the Myotide Industry in Motion Committee, is doing uh, VO2 max testing with people with various forms of muscular dystrophy, including people with myotonic dystrophy. And so that's another area where that's being done. All of that said, is it something that we really need to get? I'm going to say it's not really a necessary aspect unless your physician says it's important to see where your heart is or you know, I just really want to get it. Maybe I can go and get this done at this study. If I can get to Stanford, and that's a convenient area of where I live, it can be a helpful piece to have. But other ways of knowing a little bit about your overall cardiovascular health regarding looking at what your physician is telling you with regards to your blood pressure, with regards to your heart rate, with regards to a lot of other items that your cardiologist would be looking at. Those are the aspects that would be more pressing and important to have if you're looking at just from an overall health standpoint, as opposed to just pushing to get that VO2 max itself. Luke, did you have an additional or a different comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I think it also depends on like what your goals are. Um, which like if you want to get it tested, great, like go for it. But um if it's not depending on what your goals are, if you think if it wouldn't be relevant to your goals, then um you, know, you can again you can do it. Like it's all up to you. But if it's not relevant to what your, whatever your goals are for movement, then um, I'd, I'd say, yeah, just take your goals into consideration before you take the plunge. Nothing nothing against VO2 max testing. Um, we've never done it, but it's probably great to see where your um, heart and lungs and all that are. But um, I'd say consider whether it's actually relevant to what your goals are before you take the plunge. Excellent. Ryan, you add what you're thinking, and then we'll move on to the next question. Sure. Um, I don't know if it's the same thing or not. Maybe Dr. Locke can clarify. I did a stress test in my heart um, not too long ago. Um, I did find value in the feedback that they did give me. Um, so that's where you, you're on the treadmill and they increase the, um, how fast you're going and the incline on it. And 
Uh, for somebody like myself that tries to push pretty hard, I did get a lot of good feedback from doing that. And I think that fits in what Ryan said, back to what Luke had said. And I, I suspect that, Ryan, probably your phys- your uh, your medical team said this is a good thing to go ahead and look at for yourself and it refers you to that. Like, and that goes back to talking to your cardiologist, talking to your physician and seeing where things are that will fit into what is needed for you, both from, as Luke said, for your goals, and then also from what is needed from a medical standpoint, if there's anything that they want to look at. So with Ryan, where he's at, his, his medical team said, let's look at this to see how, how much he's pushing and getting some good information back. Uh, for myself and others with cardiac complications unrelated to neuromuscular disease, it's, that's the reason that it's done frequently as well. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of information as far as looking back and reflecting on your own goals and needs. And if there's any further dialogue to have with your own medical team to see how you can pursue that further. Thanks, Luke and Ryan. Really, really uh, appreciate those comments. Excellent. Another question for the community here. If you work out with weights, have you found that lighter weight and higher reps or higher weight and lower reps is better for people living with myotonic dystrophy? I would say it um, depends. Um, for me, um, having a light, lighter weights and doing more reps has been beneficial for me. I think that uh, other people might have different different experiences. For me, I'm 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 kind of a small, uh, light, uh, skinny little person, and so you know I do I do five pound weights, and that's and I do repetitions of not a whole lot because it, it's hard, but I do what I can do. Um, and it's probably between 12 and 10, uh, 10 and 12. And um, sometimes I'll go up to 15, 20. It just depends on on the day and how I'm feeling. Um, I can't, I don't have, I'm not, I'm a, I'm sort of like, I go with what I feel. If, I, if it's a purpose hurting me, if I'm exhausted, I'm not going to do it, right? But if I can, if I'm in a place where I can, you know, do a lot and, and be done and, and be good with it, and I'm happy with it. But it just, it's a, it varies. I think, I think that probably these guys here look like, they, I mean, they've been, Doing a lot of stuff that I don't even know what you're talking about, the big two thing. And then just like taking that 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 to supplement before exercise. That's like not even on my radar screen because I don't know, but you guys seem like real athletes. Um, and I'm just a, a, a dabbler. But uh I just know that when when I do when I have when I have when I'm in a good space and I'm feeling good, doing 20 reps with a with a lighter weight is is helpful for me. And um that's that's just my my two cents. Go on, go on, athletes. Excellent, <laughs> Ryan. Up to you. And I will also add, Ryan, as you're answering, someone is curious on what type of amino acid you use before you work out. So if you can answer that while you tag both questions. I don't know if I remember the name brand that it is. Um, I know it's just the Costco, a more generic one that Costco has on their shelves. Um, trying to say somewhat cost effective in doing it. Uh, but to answer the question about repetitions, I find that uh, the myotonia, the muscle tightness, is it's definitely something that holds me back in the beginning. So I, you know, start with a lighter weight to try and get the muscle to release a little bit, and then I'll increase the weight. But I still am not pushing for a low number of reps. It's still somewhere around that eight number of reps that uh, Dr. Lott had mentioned. Awesome. Here's a question for Dr. Lott. Um, my balance has changed dramatically, even though I exercise on a regular basis. What can I do to improve my balance besides standing on one leg or walking with one foot in front of another? Sure. So, so when we talk, and I'll just take a step back. When we talk about exercise, there's a multifaceted piece. There's We mentioned aerobic or cardiovascular resistance. I saw somebody had mentioned about flexibility that we'll probably get to. And then there's also balance. Each of those are important components to keep in mind when looking at a comprehensive exercise program. And I think Ryan, you know, that warm up that he was talking about before advancing weights fits into some of that as well. So from a balance perspective, there's three areas of our body that really help us with balance. There's our inner ear that helps us with equilibrium. There's our eyes and vision, which give us some feedback. And then there's little sensors in our joints that give us feedback. And so as you're doing things, looking at balance, it'd be looking a little bit about, is there one of these areas that's a little bit more challenging? So instead of just um, standing on one leg, well, how about if you, and again, you want to be careful with all this. So get a pillow or maybe a mattress cushion from the couch, something that's a little, that you can stand, it's a little flimsy. And Set it next to where there's a counter, a railing, a chair that you can hold on to as you step on so that you're able to maintain your balance. And then take your hands off and see how you do standing on that. That's going to be challenging your balance in a different way, in a different way of looking at which of these three areas is balanced. If that's really easy, bring your feet closer together. 
If that's really easy, close your eyes. If that's really easy, you can try that on one leg. So you can think of how you can progress through different areas by changing the environment, something that's a little softer underneath your feet. And there are other things out there. I mentioned things that you have in your home, but you'll see what they call are BOSU balls and a lot of other types of surfaces you'll see in rehab centers. You don't need to go buy all that fancy equipment, but finding things that can challenge. So that's one way, vision, and vision being changed with eyes closed, a softer surface, or bringing feet narrower together, things of this nature. The other is looking at, so that's more of a static balance where you're where it's a holding still. The other is the dynamic or the movement. And I know you had to put in your comment about you know putting one foot in front of another. So that can be putting up and having little obstacle courses where it's standing forward, having to shift to the side, stepping backwards. And you can change that and alter that. And again, making sure your safety is at the foremost of everything, but maybe have something where it's a random, um, something that's played and you're changing based on something that's changing from an audio cue. Maybe it's a song and as it picks up, you change. Maybe it's your significant other or somebody else who's a friend who says, okay, go forward, forward, down, back, back back, back, side, side, forward, forward, back. So you're having to change and make more quick adjustments. That will also help you from a dynamic kind of means for your balance. If that's pretty easy, you can change the environment. Do it on something that, and again, probably not a couch cushion per se, but on an environment that's a little bit more challenging. It could be out on the grass instead of on your tile floor. It could be on a very soft carpet as opposed to your tile floor. But how can you progress those changes of doing things where you're now having to have a, a means of, of having increased difficulty or increased challenges? The other, and I haven't seen this in my talk history, but there was a paper not too long ago that looked at... Um, people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is challenging having another task that you're doing. So it's as you're doing the walking and kinds of movements, if that's very easy, go ahead and be challenged by having to recite the alphabet backwards or doing some kind of a mental challenge that while you're doing the same physical kind of ability, it's been noted in other groups, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and healthy controls, but that multitasking forces you to be a little bit more um, challenged and it can address your balance impairments even more there. So those are different ways of how to think about it from a, from what can you do without having to go buy other equipment and do other kinds of means. But again, just make sure you're safe before you're starting anything to challenge that balance. Thank you for that um, answer, Dr. Lott. We do have a follow-up. Um, one of our attendees mentioned potential online programs about fall prevention and balance that are online. Do you know of any that you would recommend? And if not, that's okay too. That is an excellent question. I don't do a whole lot with fall prevention myself. And so I, I I don't have anything that I can tell you right off the top of my head. Um, I'm happy to look at anything that you could email me later. Say, what about this one? What about this one? I'd be happy to look at those. Or um, if you email me, reach out. I'm happy to go ahead and look a little bit and get back with you too. But unfortunately, I don't have anything off the top of my head. That is no problem. Thank you. Another question for our community members. Um, a, someone is asking, what if I do it, overdo it with exercise? What are your recovery steps um, to take besides calling your, your doctor and, and listening to your body? What do you do to recover from a hard workout? Um, not that. <laughs> That's what I do. Or just, you know, um, I have some, um, uh, anti-inflammatory lotion that I use on my joints that get sore. I my, my hips, my knees, my ankles always get taxed. So that's what I do. Thanks. Yeah, great. Ryan. Uh, so I mentioned uh, getting into a workout that my tornado is stiff muscles. Um, I think it also, cool down is one of the big things I use. Don't just stop an activity and be done. Use the cool down to try and get your muscles back used to to sitting still a bit. Um, and then also stretching. I think stretching can do a lot for you as well. Thank you. Okay. Another question here. Oh, can, can I go take a Just And that was excellent with these two to answer. The only thing I want to make sure to mention is, and while it's very rare, if you ever, after doing a lot of exercise, like you feel you really overdid it, and you notice your urine is a very dark color, that is something that you'd want to make sure you contact your doctor right away. That, that could be an indication of some muscle damage that's beyond quote unquote normal. It's not something that I, I think anybody's likely to have, but it does happen, whether that's a big football player out in a lot of heat who's doing a lot of extra work, or we had a, a somebody with muscle dystrophy not too long ago. It wasn't some things that they were doing with us, but they came and they had that dark urine. So we immediately made sure they were able to get to their physician, the hospital, to work on some fluids to help ensure that their kidneys were okay. So again, that's a 
over the top, but since we're talking about excessive exercise and any kind of warnings, I always just want to make sure to mention that if you have any dark, and when I say dark, I don't mean dark yellow, I mean like brown or black kind of urine. Good to know. Um, another question for you, Dr. Lott. Um, a community member says, I have a lot of lower back pain when I walk without support, but none when I'm pushing a stroller. I was told this is due to weak stomach and core muscles. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations? Yeah, and, and that that is a really important aspect as far as getting core because anything that we're going to do with our arms and legs for exercise or movement, our core needs to be stable. And so really having a good core that, that you can is a key piece to moving ahead. So some of the aspects that you can do are, and again, depending upon your uh, capabilities and physical abilities, if it's something that you have uh, a bit of some physical abilities, doing some things which regarding um, some plank kind of exercises can be fantastic for core. There's the progressions with that where you're you're on your stomach and are, do you have your knees touching the floor and your elbows or are you up on your toes? Same thing on your side. Um, regarding if you're having a little bit more challenging, that's a little more lighter weight, even just sitting without a, with, uh, a, a, without a chair backrest and moving arms with different kinds of very light weights, therabands, while it's working the arms, it, you're working on your torso being stabilized. And so those kinds of things, as far as just working on planks, looking at different kinds of stabilization kinds of pieces with regards to other activities you do while focusing on your core, keeping that belly button slightly pulled in towards your um, your your back as you're holding and doing movements with light weights. Those can uh, be very good things to do that, again, minimal kinds of equipment um, that are very safe to do as well. And I see Luke and Ryan have some good comments, so I'll, I'll stop there and let them chime in. Yeah, so um, this kind of going back to PT. Um, if you can, if that's an option that's available to you, that was something I went, I did PT for a while for my core. And like I said earlier, I found it really helpful. So I'd say if you have the resources and, um, that's just an option that's available to you, I'd say definitely try to take advantage of that because I, I found it extre like extremely helpful, extremely helpful for me. Um, I do have some lower back issues uh, just on top of my atomic dystrophy. But one thing that I found very helpful was a large medicine ball. Uh, just sitting on that, like if you're in front of a desk or in front of something, just sitting on a medicine ball, uh, simple rotations of your hips, left, right, forward, and then circles as well. Even something as basic as that, you might see some benefit from. And I will just add for that, if you do have get a medicine ball, like Ryan said, some of those simple things work very well. And if that gets a little bit where I feel like I'm doing quite a bit better, doing the same kind of things I mentioned in the chair while seated on the medicine ball with movements of the arms. But again, focusing on keeping that spine in neutral position. Awesome. Um, another question here um, is, if the primary goal is muscular endurance to go along with the strength, is it beneficial to do more than 12 repetitions? Dr. Lott. Yeah, so it's a great question. If we look at the American College of Sports Medicine and their recommendations, they really have, this is what we have for all exercise, which we then need to adapt for different patient populations. But it really has down to having increased amount of repetition. So getting up to at least 12 and even close up towards 20 repetitions is what they would recommend for muscular endurance. And and so that is something you know, when we look at, we, we have, I, have, I have not seen focused research on muscular endurance specific to myotonic dystrophy. But if you're looking for muscular endurance overall, that's that's what the the uh, the scientific principle would say. And so having that kind of increased repetition that you can do without having excessive pain or fatigue would be good. So that by the time you get to those last couple of repetitions, 15, 16, 17, you feel like, you know, this is all that I do and I do need to stop, which kind of goes along with what Margie had said earlier was what she has been doing. I didn't say it, but it was, she was working more on muscular endurance kind of activities. Excellent. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. So I'm going to aim this question at our community members. Um, what was it like to recognize that your exercise habits have to change as your symptoms change with myotonic dystrophy? Um, was it hard or have you found anything that's made it easier for you? So I'll take a stab at this one. Um, upon diagnosis, uh, you know, I, I had to really look a lot of things. A lot of the workout that I had been doing were upper, upper body related. Um, I realized at that point that that the leg issues I have been having, you know, going up and down the stairs, 
it wasn't because of bad knees, because I'm playing sports and surgeries. It was because of my leg muscles weakening. So I definitely had to make a large change from upper body to doing a lot more lower body. And I have seen a lot of the gain in my legs and that stairs have become much easier. Awesome. Luke? Uh, yeah, so one thing, um, it's just energy balance as well. Um, something I'm, I'm still working on. I haven't quite mastered that yet. Um, but just like being kind of like monitoring your energy levels, like, okay, can I do what I would normally do today? Like today I would, I don't know, go lift for an hour or something like that. Is it like, okay, I don't feel like I can do that much today. Or if you try it anyway, would you be like down for the count for the rest of the day? Um, so that's just something to think about there as well. Um, and then lifting weights was something I never really did um, before diagnosis. And I got into it a little bit more in college, um, which I should have started sooner because I found that really beneficial. Um, so I'm still usually the guy at the gym who is getting outlifted by everybody, but I find that I think that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Finding the movement uh, practice that works for you. You don't have to compare yourself to others. That's really great, especially as your bodies are changing. Margie, did you have anything to add? You are muted. So just. I'm sorry. I kind of spaced off. I'm, I'm so, um, uh, remind me what the question was again. I'm sorry. Just about um, accepting the, the the movement practice change that's had to come as your symptoms change. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that was, a that was, that's been hard for me to be as, as, as a young, you know, I was diagnosed when I was 40 something years old, um, 44 or something like that. And so I'd been, I'd had this active life. I walked, I lived in Washington DC for 20 years. I walked, you walked all over the place there. And, and, um, and I, I, I loved, you know, walking, miles and miles just just and it was easy until it wasn't and i moved here to kansas city which is a very car centric um community and uh i have just that was almost immediately my my muscles just start reaching so quickly so yeah my my i've done i've done some um pelvic floor exercises to work on increasing my like core and pelvic strength um uh i don't know if that that's just something that's helped me in some of the areas that we deal with, that I deal with, um, and um, and and then the, yeah, I'm doing a lot of uh, of the leg exercises to maintain my mobility, um, and and just kind of make, trying to maintain what I have and not lose any more than I already am. So yeah, yeah. it's been yeah, it's been my challenge. <laughs> Excellent. One last question that I'm going to send to Dr. Lott um, as a follow-up to that, hearing that um, Ryan and Margie both spoke about maintaining or even strengthening their legs, like Ryan said, so stairs um, can be a little easier. We have a couple of people who just chimed in with questions about the ability to increase muscle um, rather than just maintain. Um, can you speak um, about any um, information or research um, that has shown um, regarding strength training, training muscles um, increasing with DM rather than just maintaining. So the, the good news is that there actually are quite a few. And when I say quite a few, I'm not talking hundreds, but I'm talking five or six at least good randomized controlled trials with resistance exercise. And, and most of them have been in the last five years, but not all of them that have demonstrated people with myotonic dystrophy doing resistance exercise have improvements in strength that translate across to improve walking ability. And there's others that have said more recently, this helps with things such as apathy, depression. So there's a lot of other pieces. And there's one paper that recently came out that looked at some exercise that says, well, how is this happening from a mechanistic standpoint? And they're actually saying from some of the gene level that they're seeing some changes in positive manner. And so this is an area where we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of exciting pieces that are going on in the myotonic dystrophy community right now with science and clinical trials. Exercise is not going to cure myotonic dystrophy, but with what is going on for some of the pieces out there, exercise maximizes or has the potential to maximize those effects. And in isolation, exercise can have those improvements as well. So yes, there are improvements of, as far as what's being able to be seen with strength 
function and other pieces that are very important for people with myotonic dystrophy. And again, there's the, there's been a few studies, but it's been the last three or four years that has been explored more and more. And so we should expect to see a lot more of this as we continue to move ahead. Excellent. Thank you. And so right now we're ending, unfortunately, with our Q&A, but we do have um, one um, one more part of this program tonight, which is about um, a movement moment. We think it's really important to get into the practice of moving our bodies. And we know that many of you might not have a physical therapist. Um, and we encourage all of you to talk to your doctor before creating your own movement practice on a regular basis. But tonight we are going to spend the next few minutes doing a little bit of movement led by Dr. Lott um, and our community members on this panel are going to do them with us. And we really encourage you to um, join us in this movement moment. Do it as much as you can. You can stay seating. You can um, stand up. You can follow however along however you want. But we're going to spend the next couple minutes um, doing some movement moments. So back over to you, Dr. Lott. All right. So thank you, Lucy. So this is something set up more of a lower level kind of activity that ideally everybody can do at least part of. If you're in pain, stop. If you're unsafe in any way, stop, of course. Ryan is in the background standing up. So there's some things that we're going to do in standing, some things we're going to do in sitting. Mm -hmm. I do like to start off. We're not going to do as much stretching and things, but I do like to start off with just some breathing. So we're going to start with some very basic breathing kinds of things. So as we're breathing, I want you to think of inhaling in through your nose and out through your mouth. And so to start off, just we're just going to be in standing or sitting, just big breath in, filling those lungs, and breathing out. We're going to do a few of those, just easy. Inhalation, and breathing out. Just three more, nice and easy. Expand those lungs, and breathing out. And two more, and out. But again, really think of filling and expanding those lungs. Now we're going to do the same thing with just a slight movement. As you inhale, you're going to slightly lean back. And then exhale, lean forward just a little bit. So it's allowing your trunk to extend, leaning back, breathing out to kind of come down. So we're moving our lungs both through our what we're doing from our diaphragm and but also from our torso that's helping to expand those. One more nice and easy breathing in. And coming forward, breathing out. We're going to do the same thing now, not leaning forward and back, but using our shoulders. We're going to breathe in, breathing, pulling our shoulder blades back together, and then bringing the shoulders forward and slightly leaning forward. Breathing in. Expanding out, shoulder blades pinched together. Breathing out, three more. Breathing in, shoulder blades together. Breathing out, coming forward. Last two, breathing in. And breathing out. And one more, shoulder girdle pinching those shoulder blades. Breathing in and breathing out. We're gonna do one more breathing we're focusing. This time we're gonna actually, for those of you who can, we're going to bring the arms all the way up as you breathe in and bring them down and out as you breathe out. For those of you who have limitations, move your arms up as best you can and down. So easy breathing in through the nose and then lowering and breathing out. Four more just like that. Breathe in and out and in up high and out. And last two, breathing in and out and one more and out. So that's just starting again. We're focusing on how can we keep our lungs open and expanding and utilizing different pieces of our diaphragm, our shoulder girdle, our upper extremities, and our torso. Those kind of just easy things keep us starting off moving. Now we're just going to do some, again, some very basic kind of movements. For those of you who are seated, I'm going to have you just with your feet that are flat on the ground. You're going to lift up your toes, and then you're going to lift up your heels. For those of you in standing, you're going to do the same thing. And if there's a chair or something you need for bounce, hold on. You're going to push up onto your toes, and then rock back on your heels and lift up the toes. So it's a calf raise to stand up, and then back on the heels to lift up the toes. And again, if you're in your it's seated, lifting up those toes and then lifting up those heels. 
up on those toes with the calf raise for those of you in standing or lift up those toes and then back again. So we're just rocking back and forth, trying to get as much movement through the ankle as we can in each direction. So again, this is good for getting a little bit of some warm, increasing blood flow. I'm going to have you keep going while I'm talking up and down and then other way, lifting up those heels and then back up with the toes because increased blood flow, increased circulation, increased motion gets it ready for if you're going to be doing something a little bit more impactful, that those, those muscles and the joints are a little more prepared. So one more time, we'll push up onto those toes as high as you can, and then back on those heels, lifting up those toes up in the air. Perfect. So just getting some gentle movement through the, through the, uh, the ankles. Next, for those of you in, seated, in sitting, you're going to be seated. We're going to have you kick forward with one leg, right, and back down, and kick forward with the left leg, and back down. For those of you in standing, we're going to be doing a mini squat. So... <laughs> Bringing the, bringing the hips and bottom down towards the ground, arms forward as you go down, and then rising back up. So we're squatting down and up while those in seated kick the right leg forward and back, and then down for those in, 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 uh, in standing, kicking the left leg forward for those in sitting and back, and coming back on up. Squatting down or right leg forward, coming back up, squatting down, Left leg forward and back, coming back up. Now we're going to do five more of these. Squatting down and up as we kick forward as those and seated and back. And then we squat down again, left leg forward and back and go all the way up as far as you can. As you, if you're sitting in your chair, feel that as you straighten all the way through there. We'll do Three more here, squatting down nice and easy, kicking with the right leg and back, standing up from squatting position, kicking with the left leg and back, squatting down again, right leg forward for kicking and back, standing back up, left leg forward and back, squatting down. We'll do this last one here, right leg forward to kick and back, standing up and left leg forward and back. So again, this is just getting, we're trying to focus on some of the key muscle groups. This is great for our glutes or hip extensors, our quads or knee extensors, and our calf muscles. So getting things where we're working and staying, or we're isolating a little bit more with the knee extensors here. Another one we're going to do is, for those of you in sitting, we're just going to march in place. Right leg up, and then down, and left leg up, and down. And I'm going to have you just going up and forth. Those of you in standing, we're doing the same thing, marching in place, bringing up the right leg high so that ideally you want that knee to come up to about that hip level and back down and then left. So we're just going to be marching either in standing or sitting. So right leg up and down, left leg up and down, right up and down, left up and down, right up and down, left up and down, right up and down, left up and down. And keep going. If uh, this is a little too fast pace for you as you're going, you can slow down, but get through as much. And again, the motion, if you're in stay, bringing that right leg up so that the thigh is about parallel to the floor, so level with the hip, up and down. Same thing as you're in sitting. So now we're working a little bit more for the hips. We're moving through. We're keeping the torso upright. We're trying to make sure we're focusing on keeping good breathing as we're going. Let's do five more with each leg. Right up and down, left up and down, right up and down, left up and down, right up and down, left up and down. Two more, right and left. And one more right, and last one left. Great. Next, we're going to do something. Uh, this is for those of you in stand, we're going to be doing jumping jacks. For those of you in sitting, we're going to be doing jumping jacks with the arms the best you can. So as we're going to be going ahead, it's just going to be coming up with the arms and back down. For those of you in standing, we're going to be doing the same thing, arms out as the legs go out for a jumping jack and bringing back on down. So just general calisthenics that work a lot at the upper extremity, lower extremity, getting general movement. So here we go, ready? Arms up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Three more, up and down and up and down. 
And I, I know we're at time, so I'm just going to I'm gonna move just to just some easy breathing to finish this up. So just like we started, go ahead. And for, and, and for some of you, this was a very light kind of a thing, but I want to focus on a lot of different movements through the major muscle groups and then just thinking of the breathing. So we're just going to nice these again, in through the nose, out through the mouth, or more just like that, easy in through the nose, focusing on that diaphragm and really expanding those lungs each time. Three more. Be easy breath in. And out. And last two. Easy breath in. And out. And one more. Nice, easy, easy breath in. And out. So as you can see, based on, as we look at Margie, Luke, and Ryan, and as you know, there's a lot of different um, levels of what people can do. Finding what works best for you. That's where, again, having a physical therapist to give you consultation can be very helpful. But make sure that you're talking to your physician before starting. Make sure that you're doing something that is not causing pain, that is safe for you. Again, approved by your physician. And ideally, something that you enjoy so that it'll be something that'll be long-term that you'll do. Those are some of the key aspects as you move ahead. So... Thank you very much, um, Luke, Ryan, uh, Margie, and, and all of you for, for participating too. Really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much to all four of our amazing panelists. Thank you to Dr. Lott for uh, leading us in that movement mo moment. And of course, our, our three amazing models of, of movement moments, Luke, Ryan, and Margie, for sharing so much of your personal story. This does conclude our program for this evening, but I do hope to see you again next week for Little Things Count, where we'll be showing um, with Dr. Christina Kelly, an MDF early career grantee, we'll be going over um, little exercises that you can do to, to add movement to your daily life. So join us on Thursday, um, July 18th at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific for that session. And as you leave this webinar, you will notice that you'll be redirected to a screen and it asks you to click continue to fill out our survey. We are always looking looking for feedback to help make this program more meaningful for all of you. So please go ahead and fill this out. This webinar will be available um, to review again. Hopefully sometime tomorrow, we will email out a recording of it um, with the link to that survey. So thank you all for joining us for our first program of this July Myotonic Dystrophy Awareness Month. And we will see you again next week. Have a good evening.